بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. So, inshallah ta'ala, we are going to be talking about feminism and we do have, alhamdulillah, a significant amount of time um, to do so. So, we're going to try and dive into some of the history, some of the ideology, as well as how it affects us as Muslim women and how it affects um, modernity in, in general. So, before we begin, then I think it's important to at least talk a little bit about why this topic is important in the first place. Um, it may be that many of us don't identify as feminists, and so this we don't feel this topic is necessarily relevant to our lives, though those of you here probably do, maybe some of you online, Allahu Alam, or just some people in the community may not feel that this is a relevant topic. But we have to realize that living in this Western society, whether we identify with the movement or not, we do have to engage with it because it is propagating itself, whether in our media, in our on our campuses, in our communities, through people that come from those, from those academic circles. And so we do have to contend with the movement and the ideology, even if we don't identify with it because its ideas are so prominent in our society. And I actually think that it is beneficial that we are discussing as Muslims this movement of feminism. This movement has been around since at least the 1940s, but I think as a Muslim community, we're starting to discuss this uh, movement or ideology only in the past couple of years, two, three, maybe five at most, and Allahu Alam, um, really starting to discuss this issue in depth. And I think it has been beneficial because it's allowed us to do a couple of things. It's allowed us to, one, sharpen our own arguments as to why we believe what we believe. Um, it's also allowed us to even expose ourselves as sometimes we can have the correct belief, but we believe it for the wrong reasons. And so, for example, there was an incident, not the only one, but there was an incident where someone used the feminine pronoun for God, and a lot of people spoke out against it, right? And so the, the traditional, the orthodox belief is that we refer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, in the third person masculine, in particular in Arabic, but also that can translate to English. However, when we when that discussion was taking place, you saw the flaw underlying why some people believed that we use that pronoun. Some people believing that metaphorically God was more aligned with the masculine. And this is not our Islamic belief. So sometimes when we have to engage with feminism in particular, then it exposes that some in our community, while having the right beliefs, don't believe it for the right reason. And it allows us to correct our beliefs. So inshallah ta'ala, before we go any further, then we have to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us to be here, to give praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah ta'ala, we're all in the best state of health and iman. And if not, may Allah bring us to, to the best of health and iman. And we send peace upon our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we should begin by reminding ourselves or continue by reminding ourselves what is the purpose of Islam itself. We know that as Muslims, our purpose in taking on this faith and practice and belief is so that we can submit to the one true God, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in true monotheism. And we want to touch on also what is the purpose of Islamic law because a lot of the issues when we're discussing feminism have to do with why does this law affect women in this way and men in a different way. So in his book on living Islam, then Dr. Umar, he says that the five major objectives of law are the preservation of religion, self, reason, children, and wealth. And the core maxims are matters will be judged by what's apparent. Certainty will not be overturned by doubt. Harm must be removed. Hardship must be alleviated. And custom has the weight of the law. So, and then the basic of our 
sort of Islamic ethics, where we get our law from, where we get our beliefs from, is the Quran, the Sunnah, and scholarship. So the Quran, our the revelation given to the Prophet Sallallahu from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, the Sunnah, the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the way in which he lived his life. And then of course the scholarship that preserves that way of life. And so whatever ideology we are discussing, whether it's right or wrong, whether we can holistically take on that ideology or whether we want to take it apart and ask, well, what part of this ideology aligns with Islam and what part of it doesn't, then we are turning back to these original sources in order to determine the answer to that question. And so what is feminism? Feminism is an ideology and a cultural movement. The basic definition of feminism is that it is the theory of political and social equality between the sexes and the second definition being organized activity on behalf of women's rights and interests. But it's important that we discuss what feminism has pushed for, not just what it is stated to believe, but also what are the rights that it has actively pushed for. And even before we get into that, then we want to ask, so what do some of these words that we take for granted mean? What does equality mean? And why is it important? So what is equality? We know that equality means sameness, the same measure, treating two things as equal, treating them the same, whether that's equality of outcome or equality of opportunity is always an ongo ongoing conversation, but essentially to treat two things the same. And then we wanna question whether or not that is a worthy goal. So why are we fighting for equality in particular? What is the larger goal, of course, of feminism? is some kind of justice, right? So is equality the only means or even the correct means by which to reach the justice, the outcome that they want? And we should question that and look into that and Shola Ta'ala will come back to that towards the end. So why equality? Why is the fight for women's rights rooted in equality? So we have to ask, as I just mentioned, is equality the only way to gender justice? And if not, how do we decipher between appropriate and inappropriate equality? So maybe we say that sometimes equality is appropriate and necessary and other times it isn't. Or maybe we believe holistically that equality is a valuable aim, or maybe we don't. We don't believe that equality is the way to justice. But we have to question at its basis, does that align with what we believe as Muslims? And then when we say we're fighting for the rights of women, so the second definition being organized activity on behalf of women's rights and interests, well, of course, we have to ask, what is a right? Rights can be given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rights can be given by the state. Rights can be given within a family. So who is determining the rights that feminists are fighting for? And do they align with what we believe as Muslims? And is something a right, so something that you are owed, and if you are not given it, it is an injustice, is something a right just because feminists say it's a right? Who determines what is actually a right? And of course, lastly, with the last part of that definition, what are interests that are legitimate to fight for? Is every interest that women either say are in their interest or feminists say are in women's interests actually legitimate to fight for? So then we want to ask in particular, well, what exactly have feminists fought for? And actually, before we go into detail there, then uh, in, into very specifics. And we want to get into feminism and what it is and what it started out as. So as we mentioned, feminism has been around at least since the 1940s with the so-called first wave of feminism. And even though <clears throat> 
a lot of people view the first wave of feminism as having to do solely with voting rights. It, in fact, had a lot of the ideologies and foundations that are still prominent today. This is the root of it. So feminists of the first wave were questioning traditional roles. Is marriage aspirational? Are children something valuable, taking care of children? Is that valuable for a woman to do or is it a burden? Is domestic work a burden or is it something valuable? And clearly they were criticizing it and questioning whether it was something of value. And then looking at women's lives in general as having to do more with the inner world, we'll say, then is this inner work, the work of the home, valuable or should we be seeking our value in the public sphere? And criticizing the sort of ideal feminine role of the housewife and criticizing that as being dependent and that women should be independent and go and find their value and their meaning outside of the home. And then even then you see this idea that women are disempowered, that there is this patriarchy that disempowers women and keeps them in the home and keeps them from flourishing. And that the way to empowerment for some feminists who were very radical was not to get married, was not to have children. Um, and at the very least to seek a role outside the home for one's fulfillment. So one of the early feminist thinkers was a woman by the name of Simone B. D. B. DeVore, forgive me if I'm saying her name wrong. Um, so one of the interesting things that I found about her is that she actually wanted to become a nun and later lost faith before she took on feminism and existentialism and became a philosopher. And I found this interesting because I just thought about, is that parallel for some Muslim women that, not exactly, or analogous, but not exactly, in that some Muslim women find more acceptance in, let's say, the world of academia than in the world of traditional scholarship. And maybe for some women, they would have turned to more traditional Islamic knowledge if they were accepted in that realm. And so that is in a sense, one of the, the valuable criticisms is that we can look at the ideology, but we can also look at, well, what brings women to that ideology as well? So she wrote this famous book called The Second Sex. And in that, her infamous line is that a woman is not born, but made. And the interesting thing is that her ideas are actually more prominent now than they were back in the 1940s, especially in America. So we have this idea that is growing in prominence or, you know, sometimes it's hard to tell is it the majority view or just the loudest voices in the room. But nevertheless, this idea is more prominent today that we are assigned a gender, not that you are born a boy or born a girl and then the doctor just recognizes your gender, but that you are actually assigned your gender by the doctor. And so she said, um, again, that one is not born, but rather becomes a woman, so that you are socialized into your gender. There's nothing about it that is inherent, but rather society influences you to act the way that you do in a feminine manner, in the feminine role, and not that there is anything inherent um, about being a woman or significant. And the, the interesting thing as well about her is that because she was an existentialist, and for existentialists, it, to simply put it, they don't believe that this world has any inherent meaning, that you have to find that meaning for yourself, and they don't believe in God. Maybe there are exceptions, but uh, in general, they don't believe in God. And so this aligns with that ideology that you are given this role, you're socialized into it, and so if you work hard enough, you can be socialized out of it. That your gender isn't this thing that is valuable, that was given to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a meaning, but rather it is something you can be socialized into or socialized out of. And so this view closely aligns with what we call now gender constructionism. And so the same idea that gender is largely just a social construct and doesn't have larger meaning. It's not biologically grounded, but um, social. 
socialization creates men and women. And this was one of her thoughts on housewives. And I think it's crucial to hear her thoughts on, on this quote about from her on housewives because the housewife is taking sort of the most traditional of feminine roles. So the critique is really the critique of traditional femininity and not just this the singular role of the housewife. And so she said, few tasks are more like torture than housework. With its endless repetition, the clean becomes soil, the soiled is made clean. Over and over, day after day, the housewife wears herself out marking time. She makes nothing, simply perpetuates the present, eating, sleeping, cleaning. The years no longer rise up toward heaven. They lie spread out ahead, gray and identical. The battle against dust and dirt never won. So to her, <laughs> and some women may feel like that sometimes, right? Um, but to her, this was a completely invaluable, just demeaning role for women to take on within the household. And she didn't think it was worth women spending their, their time and their life on. And as you see, she said, it makes nothing. So this is not something long lasting and rather for her, women need to go out and make something um, like men that, that stands the test of time in her estimate. And Shalatala will get to uh, why that can be problematic. So then we move to sort of the second wave feminism. And so you have this continuation of questioning society and biology and existentialism and also of the constraints of biology. So uh, one feminist, she said, how to liberate my true hope? Everything is against me. The first obstacle to my escape is this woman's body. Barring in my way a voluptuous body with closed eyes, voluntary blind, stretched out full, ready to perish. So seeing the woman's body as essentially a burden, um, this is part of the feminist ideology. So another early feminist thinker was Betty Friedan in the 1960s. So her famous book was The Feminist, The Feminine, I think The Feminine Mystique, um, and she spoke about the problem without a name. And for her, that problem without a name was this role that women had within the home instead of going out and getting a career and making a name for themselves. They were so-called burdened um, by this traditional, by traditional women's work. And so this is a quote again from Simone um, de Beauvoir. And I'm sure I'm messing that name up, my apologies. Um, so she, this is about um, housewives again. So she said, she qualified housewives, she said, a parasite sucking out the living strength of another organism. The housewife's labor does not even tend toward the creation of anything durable. Woman's work within the home is not directly useful to society, produces nothing. The housewife is subordinate, secondary, parasitic. It is for her common welfare that the situation must be altered by prohibiting marriage as a career for women. <laughs> and so clearly they were uplifting traditional men's work that that is what women should be doing and demeaning traditional women's work. And, but interestingly enough, and this is why you have to go beyond the definition and look at what they actually have propagated, because a part of that definition is working on behalf of women's interests. But interestingly enough, Simone uh, de Beauvoir, she said that a woman should not be allowed to choose to be a housewife because if she can, then most would choose it, right? So there's clearly a, an acknowledging that a lot of women want to do this work, but in the feminist point of view, then this work is not worthy. And it's interesting that we live in a society now where no women aren't forced to not do that work, but we live in a society that makes it difficult for even women who want to do that work. So it makes it economically difficult, socially difficult 
to um, stay home and, and tend to her home and her children and her husband and, and even to just take a more lax, um, a more lax option when it comes to career choices, whether that's passive income or working part time. We live in a society that makes that difficult and, and in some ways is a fulfillment of what um, early feminists wanted. So modern, if we move to modern feminist thinkers, then we can think of someone like um, Chimanda Agosi. So she had the popular TED talk, we should all be feminists. And it was a similar thing of questioning traditional social norms, especially in her country of Nigeria, and questioning gender expectations. Why should it be assumed? She gave the example of going out to eat and, and she paid and then the man still assumed that the man who was with her paid. So these sort of uh, gender norms and gender expectations that, that she questioned. And it is important for us to note that not everything that feminists fight for is um, antithetical to Islam, right? So that's why we have to view it with a critical eye and ask ourselves what is and what isn't. And then also to ask ourselves, knowing what is um, opposed to Islam and what is actually aligned with Islam, then is this a movement that holistically we want to align with or not? So we want to look at some specific fights that feminists have fought for, inshallah. So while feminists put themselves in this uh, broad category of fighting for women's rights and women's interests, they have fought for very specific rights and very specific interests, right? So a few of those are, a few of their big issues have been work, abortion, and sexual freedom. So work, the right to work and equal pay. Abortion, the right to kill one's fetus or one's baby, depending what language you want to use. And sexual freedom, the right to have uh, multiple partners. So we want to look at each of these and ask ourselves what has been the long-term consequences of this movement. And we should also say that feminism is very much tied into the larger progressive movement, right? And it's also important, I think, to say that um, it shouldn't be that we are almost picking on feminism in a sense. Obviously, that's what the talk is about. But it's not that it is necessarily the worst of ideologies that we have to contend with in modernity. Um, it's one of many. In living in a liberal, secularized society, it is one of many issues that we have to contend with as Muslims. So. We want to look at it and we also want to compare it to more of an Islamic worldview. So what has the right to work brought women? What has been the consequence of it? So Okay, so women have the right to work and earn their own money, right? And there's nothing necessarily negative about that. We wouldn't say Islamically that there is anything um, necessarily wrong with that. So in the Islamic world view, however, we would say that women have the right in terms of something that you were owed and it would be an injustice for it not to be given, have the right to be taken care of by the appropriate male family member. So whether that's the husband, the father, whoever it is, depending on the family situation. So what has happened, however, as a outcome of this desire to work and this fight to work is that it's actually become a a, uh, the circumstance has been that women actually now feel obligated to work as, as one of sort of the unforeseen consequences of this fight. So in her book, Return to Modesty by Wendy Shallot, then she says, working mothers with small children now say that they work because I have to. And so she says, why do so many women say that? 
if we have been freed from oppression and are supposed to be liberated, then how does it come to pass that so many women feel forced to do what they do not? So we have almost the opposite circumstance that maybe one can say existed in the 40s, 50s, 60s, where instead of being oppressed, so-called oppressed, to not be able to work, to not um, be able to fulfill oneself through work, then women are on the other end oppressed in having to work. Whether they have a six-week goal at home, it doesn't matter. They have to work from social pressure, pressure as well as economic pressure. And this quote from a very tragic story, but alhamdulillah that she shared her story so that we could further discuss this issue. So this is a woman whose son actually um, died in daycare. And so she's discussing the difficulty of having to leave him and this inclination she felt to not leave him to be with her young son, but the social and economic pressure to, to return to work anyhow. So she said, in comparison with other mothers I knew, I felt lucky to have three months paid maternity leave after her son was born. Most of the parents in my community had only weeks before they had to leave their baby to go back to work. But nonetheless, even with three months under our belt and her baby's neck being strong enough to hold himself, I was uncomfortable with the idea of leaving him. I wanted to be his caregiver longer until he was a bit bigger. I could see how our time together in his early infancy was of so much value. How being with him every day made him more and more comfortable navigating this new environment. I noticed how he looked to me to learn things and make sense of the world. I could tell how safe and secure he felt, though it was hard and tiring at times. Every minute with her son felt like an investment in his current and future well-being. Not to mention I was hopelessly tickled with him. But what compounded the financial concern was that if I quit, we would lose our health care. Um, her partner, I'm not sure if they were married or not, worked freelance and her baby was covered under her health insurance. I felt propelled down the street, swept into the train, carried along by a system that gave me no choice but to submit to the inevitability of any working mother of an infant in America. So women now feel this pressure to work even if there is a, you know, that uh, intuition telling them not to work. There is this pressure to work because of the way our society has been set up. And it's an unforeseen circumstance, I'm sure, or unforeseen consequence, but it is nevertheless connected to this fight for women to work, the normalizing of women working, and then this obligation that women now feel to work and the lack of support that many have to do otherwise. So the Islamic worldview as opposed to that is that men remain primarily responsible for the women in their lives. So whether the woman is working or isn't working, it still remains his responsibility to take care of that woman. And this gives women the freedom to use their money as, their will, as they will, to take care of their children primarily if they choose to, and to focus that energy on that inner world. And what, what happened with, with feminism in this regard is that, again, we went from one extreme to the other, and the Islamic worldview allows for a balance that there that you can work if you choose to, but you can also focus your energy on that more traditional feminine role if you choose to as well. So the Islamic worldview is that work is an option and an opportunity, whereas work has become in our society a right and a responsibility. And the interesting thing is that another unforeseen consequence is that what you end up having is actually inequality. Because we have women in our times, a typical woman still does most of the housework, still does most of the childcare, 
and also works. Whereas the men are doing more than they did a few decades ago in, in the household, but not nearly equal to what women are doing. And so now you have a lopsided inequality in the home, um, whereas Islamically there would at least be a balance. So whether the woman is fully taking on that role in the household or she's choosing to work in a schedule that, that is um, fitting to her. So the next right that has been prominent among feminists is this right to abortion. So the feminist mantra has been my body, my rights, and the Islamic world's view is that abortion is circumstantial and allowed in certain very specific cases. Um, so what have been the consequences of that fight? So in the feminist world's view and, and as well as the outcome in our society, then sex becomes divorced from both childbearing and responsibility. So in the past, in, in our society, had a, and you know, people feel different ways about this, but had a young man or, or however old, a man gotten a woman pregnant outside of marriage, then you had this idea of the shotgun wedding, right? Of being forced into responsibility. Now, obviously there are downsides to that, but at least this idea that you would have to be responsible for life um, forced men into a kind of responsibility that is lacking today. If you read, there is a, a really interesting article about the reality of abortion, and that is that even though it's presented as um, a woman's right, my body, my rights, that, re that rhetoric, um, very often men are convincing women to have abortions. They are participating in the persuasion of this woman having an abortion, and obviously that would be in part to avoid that responsibility. So it has not been solely uh, sort of another right that has almost become oppressive for women. So there, <laughs> there was a... There was a movie, I guess it's old now, but a movie called Vanilla Sky with Tom Cruise and Penelope Cruz, I'm not sure, Cruz, okay. And um, in this movie, there was a scene where this was, so as I put as another consequence that um, sex becomes casual. So there was this scene where this woman that he, uh, Cameron Diaz, who was the character, that he'd been having this casual relationship with and then he falls in love with someone else, the Penelope Cruz character. And there's this scene where um, she, she's driving him somewhere and then she starts driving crazy and getting really angry. And uh, she says to the character, to Tom Cruise's character, she says, when did you stop caring about the promises that you made? So then the Tom Cruise character, he says, promises, I thought, and then she says, do you understand how hard it is to pretend to be your buddy? She says she loves him. Um, and then she's been, it sounds funny to say the, <laughs> these lines, I'll summarize it. But anyway, the point is that for women, this sort of right has been very lopsided because women have this emotional attachment um, to intimacy that men don't always have, that men um, don't necessarily have. So this freedom, um, this freedom to be, to have multiple partners or even to be freed from the burden of, of children hasn't really been as freeing to women because as we started out, we asked, well, is equality actually what we should be fighting for? And this is one case where it's clear to see that equality isn't necessarily what we want because how can you make two things equal among two, you know, two different genders that are not equal, at least in this regard, right? Um, so feminism,
Okay, so to look at the Islamic world's view, that responsibility remains tied to intercourse and sacred bonds remain sacred, right? So then you have this, um, this fight that feminism has been um, pushing for sexual freedom for women. So a feminist will say, well, why can't a woman be with as many men as a man can be with women. And one of the things that's interesting that we should note as Muslim women is that it's clear to see that we don't have the same starting point as feminists, right? So Islamically, we don't believe that it's okay for a man to be with multiple women before marriage, but not okay for a woman, right? We believe that it's wrong for both. And this is one of the one of the uh, issues, I think, with, with Muslim women sometimes taking on feminism is that we're taking a fight that actually isn't relevant to us um, were we to actually adopt the principles and morals of our faith. So, sorry, so we didn't go fully into abortion when it comes to the Islamic view is also that it is a family, a communal decision, that it maintains the sacredness of life. So this is not something casual. Uh, Shayuk will say that you need to refer to a doctor and there has to be a serious reason as to why someone would have an abortion. And it remains a responsibility on men and women. Abortion becomes the exception and not the rule. And there also will be more planned pregnancies at, within loving relationships. So it's interesting when you, when you sort of think about this idea, and this is touching on both abortion and the idea of, of the out of wedlock child, of the comparison between a child who is born out of a marriage where two people are committed to each other versus the comparison of a child born out of lust to people who simply acted on their lust. So it's not only a personal decision, but it's also that something that affects all of society. So then you have this issue of the freedom to be with multiple partners that feminism has fought for. So the idea that a woman should be able to be with whoever she wants. And the, the interesting sort of uh, consequence of that is that it turns women into objects. So instead of a woman being someone that a man is going to have a full relationship with, he can merely use her just for sex. Whereas in a traditional society within an Islamic society, then that would not be a possibility. There would have to be marriage, which involves commitment and rights and responsibility. And something that even feminist um, Jermaine Greer, who was a second wave feminist noted, is that after 30 years of feminism, there is vastly more pornography, which obviously makes women into um, objects. So freeing, allowing the, the um, sexual impulse to be freed in both men and women, it also it had this negative impact of turning women into objects and not really freeing them, but oppressing them in a different way. Um, so they also say in more recent years, there has been um, the so-called slut walk where women are saying that a woman can be with as many men as she wants and she should not be judged. Uh, she should not be judged harshly. So it also can have the consequence of making the act of intimacy cheap and making relationships harder. So if it uh, as someone, uh, I thought it was funny, but it was nevertheless an intelligent critique that uh, that when you take this, when you take sex outside of marriage, it actually, in an ironic way, it also harms men because in order to be a man and get married, there are certain things that you have to do with your life. You have to have a certain amount of money, maybe a certain amount of education. Um, be a decent person, a decent character to present yourself 
to a man in order to get his approval and obviously present yourself to the woman as well in order to get married. Whereas in our society, it can only take alcohol or it can take nothing at all for him to have access to a woman's body. And so what kind of men are we creating as well? And um, so Jermaine Greer, she also sat and, and she's interesting because she has at least been willing to critique the feminism that she propagated back in the 70s, right? And, and look at the consequences of it and question um, some of the things that, that she believed in. So Jermaine Greer, she said that the sexuality that has been freed is male sexuality. Promiscuity harms women more than men. Women continue to experience the momentous consequences of pregnancy, for one, obviously there are other consequences, while the male body is affected. And it may sound funny to say, but even within our culture, within our media, if you look at the music or the movies or other representations in our culture, it's clear to see, or even women's magazines, it's clear to see that women are the ones hurting in our promiscuous society. So women are asking, um, you know, the question about is the guy going to call and will he still love her and will he, you know, still want to be in a relationship with her if she um, has intercourse with him before marriage. So clearly women are the ones who are more hurt in the society by promiscuity. So this article in which a young woman, um, I think college age, she discussed um, herself being, you know, quote unquote, right, this, this sexually free woman, um, a result of fem feminism and the sexual revolution. Um, she was discussing her relationship, but then she talked about a man that she was with who now in this culture of Me Too and consent, that he constantly asked her for consent. But what was interesting, which she said, in one sense she appreciated that, but then she said, but then he never called her, right? Never set up to, never took that relationship any further. And so she said in the article, in the days and weeks after, I was left thinking that our culture's current approach to consent is too narrow. A culture of consent should be a culture of care for the other person. And the, the, title, the title of this article was called, um, He Asked Permission to Touch But Not to Ghost. Um, but the the sort of ironic thing and and part of it is very interesting because hopefully as Muslims we see that what our Prophet has taught us our own ethics has freed us from what some non-Muslims are facing in our post-feminism, post-sexual revolution and, and liberalism and progressivism um, society is that you can't really have it both ways, right? You can't really have a society where people are so-called free to have intercourse with whoever they want and also expect the level of care and concern that would exist in a society where monogamy and marriage are normative. You can't really have both. Um, so beyond the ability to say no and yes to intimacy, women are still not truly freed. They are left jilted and left with, um, they are disadvantaged by this setup. So one of the interesting things we also see um, modern feminists talk about is almost expanding the definition of rape. And so I believe this is this was passed in New York City that if both a man and woman are inebriated and they have intercourse, then that man can actually be, uh, what would the word be? Prosecuted for rape. So because they say that, well, the woman can't consent to rape in this scenario. And there was another law they were fighting for, I don't know if it was passed, 
that if a man lies in order to sleep with a woman, that should also be classified as rape because it's not true consent. Because if he didn't lie, whatever he said, he loved her or he wanted to have a relationship with her, that if he didn't lie, then she would not have um, had intercourse with him. And so we see that, that these... Uh, that non-Muslims who subscribe to this ideology have put themselves in a very strange predicament, right? But even as Muslims, you see at times um, some Muslims, some Muslim women trying to follow suit. So there has even been in the Muslim community this question of consent. And what I find funny and ironic about that is that within the an Islamic normative society or just within Islam, then the idea of consent is not needed because it's built into the larger Islamic contract. So there's consent, there's rights, there's responsibility. There's far more than that. Whereas in our society, women are not really protected. All they have is this bare minimum of consent. And so this is another case where some Muslim women are fighting for something that isn't actually applicable to our community or to our tradition um, if we knew our tradition. So then you can compare that to So then you can compare that to Islam. So in Islam, then both the man and the woman within a marriage have the right to intimacy. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then we know that he told men to approach uh, women with kindness. So this idea that we quoted from in the article that someone would ha sleep with a woman and not be kind to her. Obviously, this is zina, so it's completely outside the fold of Islam. But even within marriage, the Prophet till still telling men, recommending to them that they need to be kind to their wives, that this act of intimacy is also tied in with uh, kindness. And the Prophet he said to one of his companions, he said, Oh, Abdullah, I have heard that you fast all night and that you stand all night in prayer. And I said, yes, O Messenger of Allah, he said, do not do that. Fast and break your fast. Stand in prayer and sleep. For your body has rights over you. Your eyes have rights over you. And your wife has rights over you. And the commentary to this hadith, it says the husband should not exhaust exhausts himself in worship to the extent that he becomes too weak to fulfill her rights, um, to fulfill her rights and by, right, unless he is out earning a living or obviously in worship. So we see Islam is recognizing holistically the rights of women in this area, but also protecting them within marriage. And, um, it's also noted, it's also recognized within Islam that the wife too, oftentimes we hear about, you know, we have to get young people married or men need to get married in order to be protected from zina. But the our tradition also speaks about that in regard to women, that um, shari also requires that a wife be protected from immorality by means of her husband having intercourse with her as much as is needed to satisfy her and to provide this protection. And um, so we see that Islam clearly recognizes women's rights holistically. And so this attempt, unfortunately, by feminism to piece together um, various aspects that really can't coexist, as we already said. It really can't exist that you have people that don't necessarily care about one another who are um, committing zina together, and then you also try to force those people to care. It can't really coexist, and the law can only do but so much to, to correct this, and it's only correcting after the fact, right? Um, so, I'm, so again, I'm not sure if that law was passed, but if a man lies to a woman and then he sleeps with her based on that lie, if that law is passed and he can go to jail for rape, well, that only is correcting the issue after the fact, whereas Islam is correcting it and setting a foundation of, of safety and protection before. Um, 
of course, we have the issue with sexual freedom, as Jermaine Greer, um, as we already said from Jermaine Greer, is that it can only be but so free as long as women's bodies still produce children. And despite birth control, despite even abortion, um, women still have children. And whether it's because birth control doesn't work or because not every woman, just because there is the right to have abortion, wants to have an abortion. And so it can only be but so free when women um, still have to have children. And one of the feminist, so-called feminist hero was this, I don't know if this was the name of the show or just the character, um, Murphy Brown, who was this career woman and she also had a baby and she was doing it all on her own. And this was seen as this kind of feminist hero, this woman who is completely, allegedly independent. But the reality for women of today is that that is a complete burden to have a young child and have a career and not have any man um, who is responsible for either. That is not the ideal scenario for most women. But this was seen as, as the ideal for feminism. So, inshallah ta'ala, can we take a little break? Okay. So, inshallah, we'll just take maybe 10 minutes. Is okay? Okay. So, a 10 minute break and come back. Jazakallah khair. Okay, so inshallah ta'ala, um, I think we're going to go until at least 3.30, maybe up until 3.45, and then hopefully uh, questions and comments um, and discussion. So some other problematic beliefs of feminism are immodesty, a disregard for modesty as standard, um, anti-patriarchy issues with male leadership or male power, the demeaning of motherhood, motherhood seen as less valuable than having a career, um, or at least not superior, or having a career being superior, and individualism, self over others. So, all right, so, the demeaning of motherhood as this burden, a biological burden, a care burden. And again, it's interesting with feminism sometimes because it is, um, I believe, sometimes completely out of tune with what women actually want. So this idea of motherhood as a burden, I'm sure some women feel like that. Um, but in, in my experience, uh, just speaking to mothers, I've never heard them, them use that though. Let me not say that. I never heard them holistically categorize it as that, right? <laughs> there may be moments, but not holistically categorize it as a burden. Um, and some women also enjoy pregnancy and being pregnant. And beyond that, there is a desire of women to care for their children. And there was an interesting uh, TED Talk I watched recently where she spoke about... Um, empowering men in the home and i thought it was interesting one are men asking to be empowered in the home right um but also it's interesting because she's she spoke about she mentioned a study that showed women spend a significant amount of time quote unquote correcting the chores that their husband has done and uh, it's funny because in that, you kind of are unwittingly admitting that women have a kind of power in the home. They get to say what's correct and what's not correct. Um, and and this, uh, when it comes to childcare and food, et cetera, then there definitely is a hierarchy of women in the home um, that have it more of a power, at least over the day-to-day -day lives of their children, of their family, of their household. And interestingly enough, um, a few days ago, my, my niece and nephews were visiting. So my niece, she said something, she's three, so she said, you know, um, girls rule at home. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Uh, and she said, uh, Ma, which is my mother, she said, Ma rules in this home. Like, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> and then she said, and my mommy rules in my home. 
And I thought that was so interesting that in her observation, women were in charge. The women were the ones who were telling people what to do and in charge of, of how the household was run. So there is a kind of power there, but unfortunately, it's largely been demeaned. So we don't see that as power. Um, and then this issue of anti-patriarchy. So the the issue is that, and this is not all feminist, but at least a significant uh, voice within feminism, is that there's no distinction between good and bad patriarchy. So good and bad male leadership. That it's not, and it can sometimes be that, uh, for example, when people talk about um, the issue with all male panels, right? And in a sense, we can say, well, is that really problematic? But there is there is a legitimate point of view that there need to be women in certain spaces to have the woman's voice with, within that space and being represented for other women's comfort, et cetera. Um, so sometimes it is legitimate to question why men are dominating a certain space, but sometimes it's not. And so to not be able to have that distinction um, can be problematic. And I think that patriarchy can also, and, and again, we're talking purely about the sort of dictionary definition of patriarchy, male leadership, lineage through the male line, that it can also be beneficial because it gives men a kind of responsibility that they may not otherwise have. So women have a kind of, uh, and as we see in our society, if a woman has a child out of wedlock, more than likely she is going to be the one who is um, providing, protecting, and caring for that child, either by herself or taking on most of that responsibility. Whereas within, or even we mentioned within a household, a married couple, um, if the woman is also working, she's still working and taking on most of the nurturing and the household responsibilities. Whereas within a patriarchy or a patriarchal setup, at least the man is taking on a distinct responsibility. So within the household, he's taking on that responsibility of being the provider, whereas in our society, men and women are taking on both the responsibility of the provider, but still everything else is leaning more towards the woman. So it gives men responsibility. Um, it also sets expectations for men and what their role should be within a family, within a society. And again, for women, it comes a bit more natural to us because we are um, child bearers. So it is natural to be responsible for the child that you gave birth to, whereas the responsibility for men comes more so socially through marriage and then being responsible for a wife and children and not biologically because he doesn't have that distinct biological connection um, to his child. So then individualism, the focus um, on individual rights, women's rights, instead of a focus on harmony um, as a whole. Now there isn't an issue to focus just on women's rights, but as a goal, as an end goal, what is the end goal? Do we just want women to have more rights? Do we want like in our society, so now women are succeeding more with uh, than men in certain fields, but at the same time then have uh, finding it more difficult to find suitable marriage partners because they have succeeded and because there has been so much attention on the success of women in certain areas uh, that men have actually begun to fall behind in certain areas. So the end goal should still be harmony, even if you're solely focusing on this smaller aspect of a particular woman's rights or, or women's rights. Um, so... Feminism also devalues the feminine. And it's interesting that you see feminism constantly is rewarding, is uplifting women who take on traditionally masculine role and either ignoring or demeaning women who take on traditionally feminine, the traditionally, traditionally feminine roles. And it's interesting because you have to ask why that is because it almost becomes a kind of misogyny within feminism to say that everything associated with women is not valuable and everything associated with men traditionally 
is valuable. And that in and of itself is, of course, problematic. Um, so masculine women and increasingly now feminine men, or so the man that is um, the trans woman. We celebrate trans women, men who take on uh, this, the feminine role. So there is this celebrating of anyone who sort of goes against the more traditional uh, role for their gender and qualities and characteristics. It also makes gender into this social construct that makes it superficial. So being a man, being a woman has no deeper meaning. It's a construct, it's a performance. And that's why we have a society now where someone can simply put on makeup and a dress or, or just say that they feel like a woman and be treated as such and be told that we should treat that person as a woman because it's a construct, it's a performance, it's not something deeper, it's not biologically rooted or even metaphysically rooted. So <clears throat> there are, there have been disputes within feminism, of course, this feminism we know is not just one thing, it's not just one, one type of feminism. So we can make a note to that. <clears throat> So with this freedom, with this equality that women are asking for, there's an interesting question am among feminists as to whether a woman can degrade herself if she chooses to, right? Does a woman have the right to degrade herself if that is her choice? Um, so there was a, I guess, a hashtag movement and it was called headless women. And so what this feminist was calling for was the end of these movie posters, which it was a very interesting commentary, but these movie posters that consistently use women's bodies without their faces. But the interesting, and, and in Britain as well, there was this issue of, um, I think those car races where you just have those women who wave the flag or something. And I think they banned it or something like that. And, um, this question was brought up of, okay, but do these women have a right to demean themselves, to sexualize themselves, to be an object for men if they choose to? And so this is a difficult area that feminism uh, gets into. Something like pornography, is it degrading or is it empowering? Are those women empowered because they are using their bodies as they choose to or are they degraded because they are using their bodies they are objects for men and being humiliated um even something like like niqab is niqab a free choice or is it inherently oppressive some feminists would say no this is inherently oppressive this is something men have created for women to cover themselves and some will say well no if women want to wear that then they are free to do so and some feminists feminists they also disagree on this issue of trans women are they women because they say they feel like women which also ties into this idea of of being a woman or being a man just being a social construct um, or is being a woman, does it have a deeper meaning? Is it deeply tied to biology? So what we didn't touch on, I mean, we somewhat touched on modern feminism in um, quoting uh, Chimanda Agosi, I believe her name was, but you have this feminism that I believe she would be a part of that's called inclusive feminism that some Muslim women have uh, felt a kinship towards. So feminism in realizing that it was largely the first, second wave was largely talking to middle class white women, then they wanted to include other women and the struggles of other women. So some Muslim women found an allyship or find an allyship with uh, third wave feminism. And so the roots of some of that kinship The roots of some of that kinship can be seen as a common enemy, this, this idea of patriarchy being a common enemy, the failure of men to fulfill rights, the lack of access and inclusion in our own communities, and um, a belief in a patriarchy that has historically oppressed women. So.
Okay, we actually didn't. All right. So part of the problem, there are a couple of problems, but part of the problem with um, Muslim women choosing to be a part of this movement in some aspects, so for one, you have, and, and we're going to discuss it a bit further in a moment, but you have this idea of wearing hijab being seen as a part of a woman's right, a woman's choice, and that being sort of the main reason that we as Muslim women point to as to why we wear hijab. And though this is partly true because we choose everything that we wear, right, um, the reason that we wear hijab is for devotional reasons. It's to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not merely a choice between should I wear hijab today or should I show my hair. We wear it purposefully in order to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And part of the danger of this allyship is that we can also end up equating things that are haram and things that are halal and praiseworthy. So for example, I saw an, an image on a Muslim woman who is a Naqabi um, on her Instagram where it was a cartoon of a Muslim woman in Naqab and a man dressed in drag and essentially saying, well, we all have the choice to dress how we want. But this is clearly, or maybe not so clearly, but this is problematic because as Muslims within our religion, we cannot support someone who dresses in drag. That's not a part of our religion. It's forbidden in our religion. And so, but if you use the feminist rhetoric of choice as to why you dress the way you dress, then this is what you'll end up supporting. Anyone who makes a free choice to dress how they dress, you will then have to support. And this is sort of the difficulty in being a part of any larger movement within society is that there is this expectation, maybe rightfully so, that kind of one hand washes the other, right? If I support you wearing niqab, you should support the man in drag. But we as Muslim women, our beliefs have to, as Muslims in general, our beliefs have to come first and we have to remember the foundational reasons as to why we do what we do and believe what we believe. So we, we I don't want to say we can't, but I think it's difficult to accept the, the premise, for example, of hijab just being a choice, as is the, the feminist rhetoric for those who support it, because as we mentioned, some believe it's just oppressive. Um, it's difficult to accept this premise because it can force us to accept un-Islamic premises. And the funny thing is, well, you can say, well, I just won't accept that. You know, I believe it's a choice, but I'm not going to accept something that is completely un-Islamic. At the same time, someone who, <clears throat> someone who supports us, who is uh, doing something that's un-Islamic, someone who supports us isn't wrong to say, now you should support me, right? So it, we we're also putting ourselves in a difficult position, even if we just say, well, I'll just accept the support, but I won't give it back, right? So then we come, before we talk about the gender wars, so we wanted to mention this idea as well of feminism taking away a woman's agency. So I think there's a, a lot of, it's very problematic to have almost this boogeyman that can explain all the issues that women are facing as patriarchy. Um, it also can remove practical solutions. So of course we can, for example, of course we can acknowledge that rape is wrong, it's always wrong no matter what, but it goes to the extent that if you say, well, maybe you shouldn't go out at night, or well, maybe you shouldn't dress that particular way that could um, attract a certain kind of attention, then you are victim blaming. Even if you clearly say, well, I still, no matter what, even if you're naked, you don't deserve to be raped, even to suggest any practical solution, then you can be seen as victim blaming. It also removes re uh, responsibility. So the locus of control is placed outside of the woman herself. And ironically, this only makes us even more powerless. If you believe that all the power is with men and only they can give us power, then you're ultimately admitting that you are powerless. 
and um, I think that can be deeply problematic and also deeply damaging even to our faith to believe that if you believe that there is this patriarchy where men have all the power and women do not, well, what are we saying about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Can you hold in your mind that God is a just and merciful God and also believe that he gave all the power to men and none to women? So we want to touch on, so I included the, okay, so I included this hadith, if the resurrection were established upon you, um, while one of you has a hand of sapling, let him plant it, to say that even when all the odds are not in our favor, there's always some agency we can take. So we may not have the same agency that men have, but there is always some power that every group, that every individual has within their own um, agency, as well as acknowledging their own limits, which every human being has, men included. And this quote from Sheikh Abdullah Adhemi, where he says, the women of the Ansar, so they were the helpers in Medina that, that the Muslims migrated to and, of course, became Muslim themselves. He said, the women of the Ansar were limitless because they focused on what they could do. So, so much, so much of feminist rhetoric is focused on limitations and what we can't do. And this can also be problematic just in actually reaching our goals. So what can we do? One example, and I heard uh, Sheikh Nandui say something like this, is that women may often complain about access to the masjid, but women in our time and our society have money. Where are the masjids built by women? If we want to see more inclusive masjids, um, that is a project that we could focus on. I think he also mentioned giving uh, more money to the masjid as well, but our voices can be heard or we can create our own solutions if we focus on what can we do instead of what we can't do, which is not to say those institutions shouldn't improve, but it's to say that we can also look at our own agency. So we want to talk a bit about the gender wars before we have, um, inshallah ta'ala, Q&A and discussion. So this is just something something to think about. Do we have any agreements with feminism? Can you be both Muslim and feminist? What are our disagreements with feminism? Or is feminism antithetical to Islam? So can we solely blame feminism for the gender wars? Well, I think this would also be problematic. It would be doing what feminism does, of creating this all-encompassing, um, almost, well, okay, let's use, <laughs> I was going to say shaitan, but that may be too extreme, but using this sort of all-encompassing um, boogeyman-like thing that we can blame all our issues on. And so if we say the gender wars in our community are solely because of feminism, I think that would also be problematic. Hopefully you all have answers to this as well, but this is just, Allah alam, my observations as to what is the gender war and where does it come from. I think there is perpetual gaslighting from men and women about this is not really happening, this is not actually true, that when women are sharing their stories that it's either diminished or told that this is just not happening. And the same can happen with men, but men are just not as vocal about, about their issues. Um, the constant naming and shaming of the other gender, the labeling and dismissing. There's also the issue of a failed patriarchy in a sense, right? Because if we say that patriarchy is male leadership, if indeed male leadership was responsible in doing what it, what it should be doing and fulfilling rights, then we could also say there probably wouldn't be so many women turning to feminism if they felt fulfilled by the leadership in their community. And that's whether it's on a micro level in your household or a macro level with the um, public leadership. There is also, feminism has a part to blame in that there is this problem, I believe, of not looking for harmony and balance and just looking for rights. 
um, we can look on the micro level that even if there was a marriage where rights were being fulfilled and that was it, that probably would not be a very happy marriage. The ultimate goal is not just rights, but also harmony and balance and happiness. Um, the Equality Project has also been has also been uh, problematic, as we've already stated a couple of times, where women are actually taking on more responsibility and men are not taking on an equal responsibility. So I think, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to end here. And then if you all want to, and inshallah, I'll touch on some of the, the other things I have here. but. If I keep going, it might be another hour. So, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so very much. That was a, a, a really um, wonderful presentation, very well thought out. Um, and I'm a little bit older, so I don't know about the 1940s, but I certainly remember <laughs> the 1960s because I was in college then and uh, feminism, and I wasn't Muslim at the time either. Um, so I just I want to mention a couple of different things. First of all, the concept of feminism is a paradigm that is outside of Islam. Now, I'm not against women's rights. What I'm saying is feminism, the way the West understands it, like so many other things they don't get about Islam, it's a paradigm. And so we also have to develop our own paradigm of what women's rights are that Allah has given us in the Quran, because a lot of the a patriarchy, not whether men should be ruling over the family or whatever, or society, but uh, a lot of the patriarchy we see in the world has nothing to do with Islam, has to do with what's happened over the centuries historically. Uh, secondly, and it's I'm going to make just several different points and maybe have, ask you to comment on it. Uh, women in many countries where it's a three-generation family can easily work because they don't have to worry about babysitting because grandma's there, grandpa is there, aunts and uncles are there, uh, and so on. And um, I've seen this in India with my husband's family. Women can go work because they don't have to worry about the children. And their contributions, it, it's very different from the pressure that women feel here. Because you come home, your child's been taken care of, so you don't have to worry about a bad babysitter. And someone has cooked the food. So, you know, all the things that put pressure on women here when they work are um, taken care of through a three-generation um, family. Um, there was something else I wanted to say, but um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And um, as I heard Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad say, that a lot of Islamic law that refers to the family is difficult to understand outside of the context of the extended family that would be the Islamic norm. So that's absolutely true that we have a unique circumstance where families are operating mother, father, children, and that does put a lot of burden on women. So thank you for making those points. Um, I'll, I'll just elaborate a little bit more so you, you understand the context. Um, because uh, the, the, oh gosh, the senior moment has just <laughs> plagued me. It is a plague. I'll come back. Outside of the Muslim, the, the paradigm of, uh, feminism outside of the Islam. Okay, okay, okay. Um, I just wanted to ask you, I'm very politically involved, okay? Um, I was national delegate for two years, and so I'm very involved with the Democratic Party in the past. And um, the Democrat Party has very gotten very liberal, okay? Uh, so the idea that you have up there in regards to pro-choice, I understand that that your how your explanation is about uh, feminism and how that doesn't align with our beliefs. Um, in, in the political sphere, uh, what 
what I have had to deal with is people will ask me these questions because I'm politically involved and I'm a woman who wears a hijab and the non-Muslims will ask me this question and say, well, um, but do you believe in pro-choice? And this is my answer to them. And I don't think I'm being wrong as a Muslim to say this when I say yes, because as I would not want them to push their religion on me, I don't push my religion on them. What I tell them is, I would never do an abortion because that's not part of my faith. Mm -hmm. But if that's what you need to do because of whatever circumstances, sometimes, like right now, you know, the Republican Party is against uh, abortion, even in incest, even in rape. And these are rights that are being taken away from women in circumstances that they should be able to control. That's my first issue. The second issue is the uh, Republican Party also does not allow um, to take care of these children that are unwanted to parents, okay? They're on, um, they're, I've de dealt with uh, kids in school where they're neglected because their parents were addicts or they couldn't afford the child and they had to keep it for whatever religious reasons because um, I was in Utah, so a lot of Mormons do not do abortions. So anyways, the point is, um, is that wrong? Because um, I've had some male Muslims point out to me, but that's not part of our religion. And what I tell them is, and and often it's their girlfriends, their their Anglo girlfriends asking me these questions, okay? And, and, and they'll say, well, you know, how can you say that? You know, you know that we don't believe in pro-choice. And yet I think that it's not right for me not to because they have ownership of their body, which is what you went over. And I'm not, I'm not um, their keeper. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is if they're Muslim. And if they're not, I'm still not their keeper. Um, so I just want you to clarify why is that particular idea not something that I can maybe say? Well... I mean, clearly, anyone who's involved in politics um, and many other fields, right? Probably anywhere where you're dealing with um, non-Muslims, uh, specifically progressives, then you're in a difficult predicament. Um, but I think that as Muslims, we've taken on this idea, this principle that you know is very American, very Western, that religion is personal, and I. Alam, I absolutely don't believe that is what Islam tells us to do. That is our Islamic way. We believe in what we believe because it's true, not because it's personally, I choose to follow Islam, but if you want to be Buddhist, that's great. Like, no, we believe Islam because it's true. And so uh, what you say is different from what you believe, right? So I'm going off of what we believe that do we have ownership of our body? Well, no, not absolutely. You know, we can't kill ourselves, right? So if someone was going to say, you know, my life is terrible, I want to kill myself, we wouldn't say, in part because it's still, it's not socially acceptable to say, we wouldn't say, well, it's your choice. I don't believe in suicide, but if you want to kill yourself, you know, that's on you. Um, so I think we have to realize that, in part, that is because of the society we believe in, what we choose to say or believe and it's almost as if it will if it aligns with you know popular society then we're more than willing you know if someone said well i want to kill myself we'd probably say no get help don't do that but if someone says i want an abortion because we live in a society that believes in pro-choice then we say well that's your choice i wouldn't want to do it but you know that's on you um as muslims we also have to develop deeper thought on this issue so again, we don't just not believe in abortion in an absolute sense because we just don't believe in it. You know, we have to better understand the deeper reasons. What, a, what about the sacredness of life, right? What about that life being created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you don't own that life? Um, what about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us do not kill your children out of fear of poverty. And that's a lot of the reason, I don't know if it's majority, but that's a significant portion of why um, women kill their children, have abortions. So what are you going to actually say? Um, that's a difficult question to answer. But again, you know, I see and I admire, I admire Catholics in some way, the Catholics in our society, because they're very, not all of course, but a lot of them are very straightforward about their belief, but they've also sort of developed a deeper philosophy so that they can explain well why is life sacred and here's also some of the science and you know here's 
here is why I believe what I believe and not simply, well, that's just what I believe, right? Um, so I don't know, maybe it's better to just avoid these conversations. In the end, is it a personal choice in terms of the state? Well, it is. So you wouldn't necessarily be wrong in saying, well, it is your personal choice if your intent is saying that it is your personal choice according to the society we live in, you know, according to the current laws. But do we believe just a personal choice as Muslims? Well, no, we don't. So maybe there, there is um, the aspect of intention there is also important. Thank you so much for um, your lecture. I'm so sorry I was late. I had something that I had to do, so I'm bummed that I. Um, I'm so grateful to be able to get a chance. Alhamdulillah, I'm grateful to be able to ch get a chance to um, hear you speak. Um, and thank you for your thoughts. I really appreciate um, your critique and your analysis and your insights. Um, I read some of your work. I've gone to your website, got your Twitter feed, and actually commented on some of your tweets and did researched your references and your papers and I really kind of like looked at your work extensively, not Which extensively, but when I saw you were giving a talk, I stopped and I really like oh, looked you. at your work for a second. I saw the book that you um, submitted, that you have an essay in. I didn't read the Hadith of Aisha, but I really like to, but um, amazing work and thank, thank you, you so much. Um, I'm, alhamdulillah, I'm so grateful for your work. Um, uh, so a couple of things that have, um, that have occurred to me in your talk are, um, quick question, first of all, um, I'm, I'm confused about your thoughts on the separation of church and state in the United States. So um, you're saying, I work in mental health, and um, you're saying our religion trumps everything else. Our religion is, pardon the use of that word, um, <laughs> our, religion is, um, our, our religion is prioritized over all other things. Um, and I understand that on a personal level, and I know you're saying you can't separate this and um, uh, uh, the personal kind of opinion, but um, I, I'm curious about how you see um, living in a diverse and multicultural um, nation, um, particularly in the United States where we have such an incredible diversity, um, and, um, and saying things like, um, you know, our religion is ahead of everything else, and, yeah. and that can determine how we vote. Um, wondering how you see church and state separated working into that first question. Um, second is a comment, which is that um, I, um, I have a background in feminism, have read a lot of feminism, and um, was raised in a very feminist household. And um, I love your work, and I say this with the utmost respect and care for you as a scholar, um, for, as an academic, and as a thinker, um, and um, want to um, contribute to your work as a sister um, and as a teacher, that um, making, and you, you did acknowledge this, and I want to say I did hear you acknowledge it, but um, making statements about feminism with that kind of blanket inclusion of so many strands of thought is really, really dangerous, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and you run the risk of losing, I think, some of your more really vital points about um, women's rights and gender wars um, because you're making blanket statements. And the final thing I'll say, I have to try and make this quick. Final, another comment I have, and I'd really like to hear your comment on this, is your use of the word patriarchy equates it with father rule. But I think that's a misunderstanding of um, a traditional kind of, again, feminist critique, or feminist is multi really diverse, but a feminist critique of patriarchy, which is patriarchy from a Christian perspective, which is that men dominate women and dominate nature. And it's not about father rule per se, as perceived in Islam. So I have argued for a long time that prophet, the prophet, peace be upon him, was not a patriarchal person. He did not believe in patriarchy, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
He did not believe in patriarchy because he did not believe in abusing and oppressing women in nature. And uh, talking about patriarchy and the way you're talking about it um, tends to, I think, um, misunderstand, kind of like a, um, it's a misunderstanding of the critique, which is abusing women and nature with men in power. Women can be in power and practice patriarchy by abusing weak and powerless people. So the critique of patriarchy is about dominance and abuse, not about men. So understanding that is really critical, I think, to deconstructing societal problems, especially in terms of women. And the last thing I'll say, I think I've lost it. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Um, I really, really appreciate your work again. Um, I have the utmost respect for your work. And thank you so much for your contribution. I can, will continue to read you. And I'm um, looking forward to getting your book and reading your essay in that book. Thank you so much. OK, so. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think uh, the problem that I find with uh, I don't know if it's feminism or feminists is that there is often this sort of uh, what can I say? there is often this rebuttal that feminism is many things when people critique it. And I think the problem is that, as you said, I did acknowledge that there are different strands of feminism, which is why I started with the dictionary definition, because that, at the very least, I would hope feminists agree on the dictionary definition of feminism, and then um, mention, sort of as an honorary mention, different strands of feminism. For one, I think when we're critiquing feminism, we are critiquing the feminism that has seeped most prominently into our society, right? So there is eco-feminism, there is liberal feminism, there are all kinds of feminism. Um, but there, there's another one, I can't remember the name right now, but there's another one where they very much believed in the value of women's work and uh, in the talk we're doing tomorrow, I think her last name is Ferenci, I don't completely remember, but there was a movement called Wages for Housework. And they said, you know, why should the production of cars be more valuable than the producing of babies and having children and caring for them? So absolutely, there are different strands and some agree with Islam more than others. However, that particular strand is not what won out. That is not what seeped into our society. So my critique of feminism is the feminism that has affected most of us. Um, when it comes to the definition of patriarchy, I mentioned that one of the problems I see with, with feminism and this, this idea of patriarchy is exactly, I, I think, what you did there is not distinctly separating good, what we can call good patriarchy, from bad patriarchy. The idea that patriarchy is abuse and anyone can can be patriarchal, Allahu alam, you know, I think that's a stretch of the word to the point where there, it would almost be pointless in using it. If it's just about dominance, any group can dominate, right? So why call it patriarchy, right? Um, but I think, at, again, we went to the dictionary definition there where it's about lineage through the father and leadership of men, both in public and in the home. So if feminism is critiquing abusive patriarchy, well, who would disagree with that? But I think very often it's not only critiquing abusive patriarchy, which is why you see people saying smash the patriarchy and talking about all male panels. There's no abuse happening if there are five men on a panel, right? But it's about, well, why are those men sitting there? Why isn't there a woman? Why isn't there representation? Most of the men being CEOs. People also use that, talking about smashing the patriarchy and talking about men having most CEO positions. There's no abuse happening there. Not inherently, obviously. Some CEOs are abusing the environment and their workers. But inherently, there's no abuse there. But it's just purely about why are there so many men there and hardly any women. So when I'm talking about feminism, again, I'm talking about what has touched most of society.
but I'm also talking about what feminism actually does and fights for. So I, I understand your definition. At the same time, through example, it's very clear that some of them are purely talking about male leadership. Whether it's abusive, not abusive, doesn't matter. It's about male leadership and that in and of itself being problematic, which I think is problematic. Abuse, we can separate out and say that's a problem. Um, but I think we have to look critically as to when it's relevant to say men being in power here solely or mostly is, is problematic. And when it's relevant to say maybe it doesn't matter. And Allah alam. Assalamu alaikum once again. Um, that senior moment passed. Hopefully I can remember what I was trying to say. Uh, it happens at around age 45. <laughs> okay. Um, what, I, what I wanted to, to point out, and, and maybe this is underlying what you're saying um, as a background. Uh, we have what's called Western society, whatever that is, or Western civilization, whatever that is, and the Islamic worldview. Yeah. The Islamic worldview has certain moral standards that are permanent. They don't change. This is what Allah has given us in the Quran. Whereas in the um, Western world, what's expedient is what's done. So we may have had a rule about something a generation ago, but now it's not expedient anymore. So we now come up with something else to justify why we're going to change that rule. So the, the point with feminism is some of these issues that Western feminism addresses, and you're absolutely right, a lot of it is white middle class um, orientation. Um, because poor women have always had to work, uh, always had to work, usually in, um, and at any rate. Um, so the, the, the idea of, of feminism and what issues are selected from a Muslim point of view, there is a feminism within Islam, but I think we have to look at what are the issues within the Muslim world. And the fact that, for instance, a father might, I'm thinking of India, a situation I'm aware of, and many situations where women are forced to marry someone that they're absolutely dead set against marrying because that's what the father, maybe even the mother, have decided the, the young woman is going to be forced to do. It's this kind of uh, patriarchy that we should be against because women, that's not, that's not the prophetic way. Women has to give her consent. Uh, I don't know how much that's happening here in the U.S., but that's just one example. But I'm thinking we, we have to have a feminism that's Quran-based, that's Islam-based, and not just take Western concepts and try to somehow um, push them around this way and that to kind of conform to, to what we think we can accept. Okay. So, so you're saying we need an Islamic feminism? Mm -hmm. I guess the, yeah. What is it, um, the, the issues within an Islamic framework that we legitimately need to correct? Because what, what Allah has said is, is there. What the Prophet ﷺ said and in the Hadith is there. But what's happened historically over the centuries that's been used to justify women staying in the house uh, or wearing the niqab, which is completely outside of Islam. Allah says in Quran, tell the believing men, when they look at the believing women, lower their gaze. When your face is covered up, you're disobeying Allah. How can you say the cop is part of Islam? It's an upper class thing that existed in many societies historically. That's what the French, the mask, the masquerade is, the same thing. So what I'm saying is we have to look at what issues in, in the Islamic world, and, and certainly in America for Muslim women, uh, make sense. For instance, I'll give one last example. When my kids were, were growing up, and this is Southern California, 
they always had when they had the youth group, the girls were here, the boys were there, don't talk to each other. Oh, don't look at each other. The parents were coming from another part of the world. What happened? All those boys married non-Muslim girls because they never got a chance to talk to Muslim girls in a halal environment, in the masjid, in a public space. Not two people in a room where the door is closed without the shaitan is the third party. So because of these silly rules and not understanding what the atmosphere is in America, we've gone to so many weddings and we've seen so many young people where they're not married to a Muslim because they were told, no, don't look at each, don't talk to each other. When you develop friendships with people, those are the kind of people you're bound to marry. That's a very specific example that uh, a lot of very um, wonderful Muslim women in their 30s and 40s can't find husbands because the men went somewhere else. I think it's, uh, I don't know, I think the idea that we need an Islamic feminism, in one sense I could say, well, why do we need an Islamic feminism, right? If we know that these issues aren't rooted in Islam, why don't we just need to return to Islam? Um, if it is truly rooted in Islam, is it necessarily problematic? Maybe not. Maybe if it was, you know, Islamic minimalism, Islamic environmentalism, you know, I don't know, maybe those things aren't inherently problematic, but I would question if we truly believe, which we should as Muslims, that these issues are not an outpouring of Islam itself, but actually of our not following Islam, then why wouldn't we simply turn back to Islam and why do we need to give it a new title and attach it to feminism? What would the benefit be? Just, or, you know, rhetorical question. Assalamualaikum. So we talked about feminism from um, like a academic level, political level, conceptual level, like brass tacks, like at a family personal level. Like I've talked to a lot of Muslim men and it's very rare when I talk to men that they find like a, a, a hardcore feminist, let's say, a, a feminist female very attractive. Like. Um, it's difficult, a home life, family life, et cetera. And I'm just wondering if the opposite is also true, right? Like as a female, having kind of a more feminine male husband is attractive or equally unattractive. I can take a poll. <laughs> <laughs> What, uh, I guess, uh, uh, what I was saying when I was, when I talked to, when I've talked to other uh, Muslim men about what is unattractive is about, uh, I guess kind of the word you had up there before about the boogeyman, mm -hmm. like how like everything is the man's fault because, right, that, like that. Right. right. Yeah, well, I think this is one of the ironies, right, that we somewhat touched on where there has been such an emphasis on women succeeding in career, in school, but then there is this sort of strange irony now of men falling behind in, in both of those uh, realms of life. And so who are these women going to marry? Um, so, yeah, of course, it can be difficult in, you know, in general, uh, the feminine attracts the masculine and vice versa. Um, so, you know, I, I think the answer is obvious, but I think, you know, your point is still valuable that those women who are fighting for those feminist rights, what are the consequences within their personal relationships? And do they, do they really and truly want the kind of man that seems to be ideal um, within feminism? And 
you know, I think that's an ongoing conversation, but it is valuable to think about. Welcome, sister. It's nice to um, see you in person. And um, I'm actually from Canada, and I'm just here for one week. Oh, okay. And so I'm sorry if I'm not very coherent. So I'm a little jet lagged still. What's your name? <laughs> Aisha. Um, we're friends on Facebook. And yes, your face looks familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and I always appreciate your input because I like to follow um, issues of feminism closely on social media. And often your, your name pops up with very, very insightful comments. So I feel very blessed and privileged to have been able to catch your, your thing today because I'm only here for a week. So alhamdulillah. Um, I wrote my question down because, again, jet lag, so I want to make sure that I was making sense. Um, I want to say, what would you respond to the idea that wanting interests and goals um, outside of motherhood is a result of being like brainwashed by individualism and wanting to make a mark on the world outside of child rearing um, with the understanding that child rearing is the most valuable thing a woman could contribute to society? So I feel like there's this idea, um, maybe also prevailing within the Muslim community, that um, like a man's purpose is to provide and a woman's purpose is to nurture, and that we should find like fulfillment within within those roles, and that everything outside of that is like a distraction. Mm -hmm. So I think also that could play into the whole idea of like like feminism being a pushback where women for a long time felt like they didn't have that choice, like if they wanted to go be an artist or be a writer, like something like that, it was something that was like, well, that's just a distraction from your, your womanly duties. Mm -hmm. So what would be a good response or what are your thoughts on this of like, you know, if a woman has interests, um, not necessarily just even like work in a, as part of a company or anything, like just, you know, she's not an entrepreneur and an artist or something, but she's also a mother, mm -hmm. you know, there's this idea of like, oh, she must be neglecting her motherly duties if she mm -hmm. can find time for her. Yeah. you know, a hobby or interest. So how would you respond to that idea? Yeah, I, you know, as Muslims, we shouldn't sort of take the other extreme, right? So we know that Muslim women have had prominent positions um, within, within our Islamic tradition, and some have even not been married or not had children. I mean, all of the Prophet's wives, um, except for a few, didn't have children or didn't have children from him. But quite a few didn't even have children. Our mother Aisha anha, did not have children and we know her impact um, on on us as Muslims. So we can't we can't fall into the other extreme of sort of being deterministic that our only sole value as women is to get married and have children. Um, However, as one of the sisters said, and it is a really important point, we don't live in a society that is, um, well, obviously it's not a, an Islamic society, but it also doesn't even have sort of traditional sort of nor normative family value sort of thing. So any woman who wants to pursue a career and is married and has children has a very difficult um, task on her hand. And, you know, even um, now you see, I've been seeing a lot of feminism focus on this idea of men need to do more in the home and men need to participate more um, with child care because the older feminist idea of a oh, woman can do it all is, uh, is actually exhausting, is actually not, you know, positive or ideal. Um, however, will men actually take up that slack? And again, is is that actually what women want? Because there are always um, there are benefits, but there are also setbacks. The more a man has to do in the home, the more a man has to um, take on childcare, the less he can pursue in his career, the less money he will be making, maybe the more that she'll have to make. So there's always going to be sort of um, a positive and negative, especially when there's no outside support. Um, but if a, whatever a woman wants to pursue, um, you know, if it's valid within Islam, of course, it is can be valuable. I think the Islamic consideration, however, if she does have a husband and children, is about prioritization. So if you do have young children, if you are married, that is going to be more of a priority than a career outside of the home. But that doesn't mean that... Um, 
you can't also pursue that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that that's a good point as well. Um, I think the only difference with men is that if they're working harder, it's directly positively affecting their family. Whereas for women, even though today it can also directly positively affect their family, but it's not their obligation. So if he was to work 60 hours and that brings in more money and so they have a better lifestyle, um, that would be more beneficial in a sense, like it, it can lean more in the man's favor to be outside of the home more because of that obligation. But still, as you said, if he has a wife and children, he also has an obligation to them. Um, yeah, so I'd, I'd just, you know, summarize it how I started that we shouldn't take the other extreme of believing our only value is in being married and having children. Alaikum. I really value your um, discussion here. I think it's such an important discussion that um, should be, I would have loved to have listened to this many years ago and uh, it would have um, resolved a lot of tension about mm -hmm. working and not working, being happy, being a mother, but also being pulled towards a career. So um, this is a fascinating and very important discussion. Mm -hmm. I do want to just say in regards to men, as I understand it and see it, there was something that came up in your discussion too where you mentioned that um, you know, men don't feel a biological pull towards as much towards the child rearing and, and taking care of the children. And, yeah. and as you discussed over here, their role uh, financially, um, I do think that we have to very much acknowledge also the importance of a man's role in helping to raise his children and being part of that uh, family unit. And even our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, um, Hazrat Khadija, supported him initially uh, and her role you know she she was the one who who took it, had a financial role there so mm -hmm. that can be i don't i i don't want to see you know the this idea that a, a man shouldn't be involved because he just has to be the source of income i think is unfair and also creates perhaps a tension within a marriage as well if there's too much burden on one side I mean, it's a collaboration and, and a loving collaboration and respect between two people where there's a give and take. And I think each individual situation might be a little different. So I just want mm -hmm. your thoughts on that. Yeah, and, and that is the blessing of Islam that we have these ideals and foundations, but there is still a lot of room for the individual, right? So if someone was married and wanted to, the woman had a career where she wanted to pursue and be the sole breadwinner and the man wanted to take care of the children primarily, they could, right? It's not haram to do so, even though that isn't aligned with the Islamic ideal, it may work for some individual um, couple. The comments I am making in the previous lecture, they stopped me because the ears do not want to listen to this truth. Today, there are Muslims, no Islam at all. You have to understand what is first Islam before you discussing all this. Today, there is Muslim countries, but no Islamic country. There is a difference between Islam and Muslim. The whole world will turn to peace if there is only start one is a real Islamic country. You have to understand Islam. 
Do you know when Islam started? Who started Islam? Do you want me to answer that question? Yes. Okay. You have just want to take out from me or me. <laughs> no, sir. She is going to answer this question. Well, Islam in the true sense of the word of submission to one God started at the beginning, of course. Adam submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Eve did, and everyone thereafter who were uh, true believers. So in the larger sense of the word then began with the first man, of course. I just wanted to ask about the equal pay issue in the feminism that you re referred to. Why is it that we can't believe in that as well? Because if we're going to go work in the workforce, because we choose to, and I always tell my husband, if I choose to, all the money's mine. So that what Islam gives me. So, um, but of course, most of us, we go to work because we want to betterment our family and help, you know, and not put too much burden on our husband in, in the way of cost of living is nowadays. So um, my question is, why is it that we cannot believe in the fact that we should get equal pay? Because as it is, we're not getting paid at home. So why can't we ask for in the, the man's world that we're going into, get equal pay? And why can't we support that as a feminist? Okay, I'm not sure I understand the premise of of the question. Yeah. Can I paraphrase it? Sure. So she's asking why we cannot ask for equal pay if we are going out and working because anyways we do not get paid at home. So, you know, if we are making this choice of uh, opting for a career, yeah. then we, why we cannot get paid uh, for the same job that men are doing? To. I think she she made a point why men get paid more. I think I that was. I don't remember mentioning <laughs> pay at all. Yeah, excuse. that's interesting. The three points that I remember you mentioning was okay. one was work, one was the abortion, and yeah. one was the sexual freedom. I'm not interested in the sexual freedom. I already addressed the abortion. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just want to know about the work aspect that you were okay. referring to. Okay. So, um, we were speaking about the consequences, the consequences of this fight to work and, and one of, some of the, some of the consequences to that fight being that women now feel they have an obligation, that women now have a social, economic, have been put in a position where they feel like they have the social and economic obligation. Um, but we started, I believe we started by saying that, well, Allah Alam, but the working in and of itself isn't necessarily the issue. And if you are truly working completely equal to whoever else, then I suppose you should be paid equally. Um, my... It's funny because I didn't mention this, but what I've written about this, this topic of gender, the gender pay gap, is that the way in which it is discussed is not its reality. So the reality is not two identical people, one man, one woman, and they're getting paid differently. 
any case that that is happening is already against the law. What feminists are talking about, and it's been against the law since the 60s, right, with the Equal Pay Act. Um, what feminists are talking about, not the way that they put it, but when you dig into the research, is that as a group, women make less than men. Well, and I, I discussed this um, in the article that I pulled up, is that it's not a gender pay gap in terms of, again, two equal people and you're just not getting paid the same because you're a woman, but there are issues that make it difficult for women to equal, to make the same amount of money as men. So one is that there isn't, uh, well, for one, universal child care, we don't have maternity leave, we don't have on-site nurseries, so this makes it difficult for women to stay in the workforce when they have young children. Um, and obviously the money they have to pay to um, daycare. Women also are more risk averse, so they don't ask for raises as much as men do. Um, I mean, there, are, there are a couple of issues that I cited as to why there is this gender pay gap between men and women, but again, it is not as feminist presented. If you go into a job and you are literally equally qualified, equal everything, and they're paying you less because you're a woman, that's illegal. So women, what feminists are discussing, this idea of equal pay, I'm not even really sure what, well, let me not say that. So some of them have actually said, one, men also work more, slightly more. They work more overtime. So there have been some feminists who actually say, we should get rid of overtime. I believe that was done at Reddit. Get rid of it because women don't work as much and that will equalize the pay gap. Well, is that just? Is that fair? Is that equality? So that particular issue, that's not a matter of whether or not it aligns with Islam. You have to look at it in a lot of detail and see the areas where, yes, it aligns with Islam. Of course, we believe people should be paid equally if they're truly equal, which is rare anyway. But if they are truly equal, um, but the details of it, that's a different issue. Should someone not be allowed to work overtime because other people don't ask for it? Is that just? So, um, yeah, those are my comments. I'm not sure if there was a question, but those are my comments on, on that issue. Right. Just as two women may not be equal, and just as a man and woman may not. Yeah. But we're presuming that in similar work, men and women have equal capacity to do good work and should be paid equally. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Clarifying that point. Well, that isn't quite what I said. Um, I, my point, my conclusion is that, well, let me say. I think it is problematic to be a feminist because we cannot holistically accept it. That's not the same as saying that we don't align on every single issue. There are issues we align with, there are issues we don't. So something um, more innocuous, let's say like environmentalism. Can we be Muslim and be environmentalist? Well, I don't really see any issue that we couldn't align with them on. Maybe there are some, but I don't know of any. Um, whereas with feminists, maybe if we go issue by issue, it's half and half. So can you call yourself a feminist and not agree with half of it? Maybe you can. Um, and one other thing I mentioned is that I, I do believe there still is this kind of pressure that if we support you, you support us, which would also make it difficult to be Muslim, a practicing Muslim, and fully be in that movement. But Allah Alam. Right, it's just, uh, it just a thought that occurred to me that like I think the reason is a lot of the times like it's sort of people make it black and white like are you feminist or are you not as in right. feminism means do you support women or not mm -hmm. and then whenever you're like well no I don't label myself feminist then usually it like will um, have some red flags for people like oh you must have some you know some reasons why maybe you know you don't fully support women or something like that so I think it's just it's more of like um, a word thing yeah than an actual like what does feminism actually mean because that used to be the way i used to think if someone said i'm not feminist i'd be like Meh, like mm -hmm. you're canceled so yeah. you know maybe it's just we just need to be a bit more understanding of what the words we're using actually mean yeah so anyway that was really interesting 
Yeah, I, I think that's that's absolutely right. <clears throat> um, feminism for some people can simply mean women's rights. So if you say you're not feminist, why don't you stand up for women's rights? Um, it is a funny thing with words, right? So in a sense, maybe superficially, we could all be feminists if we believe in women's rights, right? Um, but in any sort of deeper interrogation of the word, of its roots, of its practices, it becomes a lot more difficult to um, call oneself feminist. I mean, a similar thing would be if someone asks, you know, do you support Black Lives Matter? And you say no. Oh, well, you don't like black people, but you could be saying no because they support, you know, homosexuality in the LBGT community. So the reason you're saying no has nothing to do with a more superficial understanding of the movement. Um, so, so you're right. It could just be a wording thing, and sometimes we're using the word differently. We have eight minutes until four. If you want to go until four thirty. Just on that same point, just a quick comment. I think there's a perception, a stereotype in the society in which we live that because we're Muslim women, we're not empowered and we're somehow oppressed. And that's mm -hmm. where that word, when, you're, when, when there's a contradiction to being feminist, is equated with us not standing up for human mm -hmm. rights, whereas nothing could be further from the truth mm -hmm. when you actually examine it. So maybe that's where some of that tension lies. And that's a really good point. That yeah, that could even also be the motivation for some Muslim women to call themselves feminists, to make it clear, no, I'm not oppressed, I'm a feminist. So that, that's a really good point. Thank you. Well, first, thank you as well. I'm a fan of yourself and your whole family, pretty much, so I'm doing that. And I just wanted to say I'm Thankful to be here, not just because it was my job to be here to, to record and preserve and hopefully share this lecture, but also as a Muslim man, I'm also happy to see other Muslim men in the audience uh, where often when you see the word feminism, you know, it's kind of like a scare term almost and men will feel a kind of a retreat from that because there's a negative assumption sometimes. And understandably so, we have a lot of media, uh, contemporarily speaking, that tends to show the male and especially male fathers in a very negative and absent tea light and there's a, there is a social reality to that but when it's now portrayed as like a dominant this the guy is not absent or males are portrayed as like the idiots in the film mm -hmm. or unintelligent in the film you know you can't underestimate the impact that that's having on a generation of men then you combine the, the on top of that this gender fluidity push and this big question mark about gender, and it's like I fear for our future of our, our kids growing up in that type of culture as presented as the norm. Um, so my point is that I what I what it makes me appreciate is religion, and in particular one such as Islam that I converted to because it gave clarity to me on these issues. I really didn't even know what a man was honestly until being presented with it as a Muslim, and it frightened me. To be honest, um, men was, you know, as a young guy growing up in this uh, secular culture, was, you know, you're just chasing your desires. And Islam just shifted that dramatically in terms of this thing that you're, you're after in a woman in terms of your desires. You have, to, you have to, number one, have God's permission. You have to fulfill certain conditions. You have to have consent and there's responsibility. And that I think that religion really offers what in, the important thing that religion offers is a compelling force outside of the self and that has an authority over the self. Whereas my fear with a lot of these movements, secular movements, is that in itself. There's no outside compelling authoritative force other than the self. And the self is self-serving and it flip-flops. So you can't agree on feminism because the definition flip-flops. If I say I'm feminist because I agree, I support the rights of women, well, that's just my understanding of it, but that's not this other person's understanding. And who's the, the, the current authority of that movement? It just shifts. And so I appreciate that we have outside compelling forces, God, you know, primarily, and then these realms called heaven and hell. I appreciate the existence of heaven and hell because 
it compels me in my relationship with my wife on a daily basis. It's like, do I really want to oppress my wife? Do I really want to not give her her rights? There's times in the relationship, yes, well, I'm kind of self-serving, but the religion has always given me that self-check system outside of myself. You see what I mean? All the time. And so I know, okay, if, if I wrong her in this moment, it's not just, oh, I upset my wife. It's like, you can go to hell. Hmm. You can get burnt. I don't want to get burnt. I don't want to go to hell. Therefore, you better act right. <laughs> and also, paradise is awesome. So why wouldn't I want to be with this woman in paradise? If I can be with her here, why not be with her forever in paradise? So why would we want to mess that up? So it gives you like forgiveness. The gift of religion is also repentance. To say sorry, it's some, something compelling me to say sorry to God and also to anyone else that I've infringed upon. And so I think it's because we're also interacting in a dominant culture that does not have this higher authority belief system, it's easy for that to weaken in terms of our clinging to it and just our mere appreciation of it. Mm -hmm. So that was my It's, a, it's not a consistent definition. So the idea that it's not a consistent definition makes me think about, oh, wait. So every time someone asks me, are you a feminist or not, I'm like, do you have 40 minutes? Because <laughs> I have a lot to say. So I, I think uh, highlighting the idea that we believe in women's advancement. We believe in women's equality. We believe that a woman should work if she chooses to do so. Those are the important things to do is highlighting that. I think we got hung up on the idea of like, are we feminists or not? Why and why not? Yeah. I think just understanding that idea and understanding it on a micro and a macro level, um, you know, understanding what is happening in our community. Are you uh, aware that there are many women are living with in households with oppressive men, right? Mm -hmm. um, or you know, just having these discussions in the community is what really solves this thing, not just mm -hmm. being hung up on the word feminism. Yeah, yeah. Shall we wrap it up? Yeah. Thank you so much for your contribution. And it's 4.30, and she has been talking for two and a half hours. <laughs> Uh, so thank you so much for coming here, and uh, I hope, inshallah, I bring Tofik to your life, and it was beneficial, and inshallah, we'll come again, and many more such interesting programs. Uh, please do not forget leaving surveys. Jazakallah. <laughs> um, Assalamu alaikum.